should be the mother of our woman. She didn't really have any credentials to qualify her to be the mother of God. Really, her only credential was that God chose her. I mean, she might have been really good and innocent and beautiful. There's no evidence of any of that. She certainly wasn't a royal princess. She wasn't a holy priestess. She was a plain, and at least to the world's eyes, an utterly insignificant young woman. But God elected her. God spoke to her. He honored her. And God elevated her <coughs> to the highest ranks of heaven. Now, while we love Jesus and follow him, only Mary, only Mary knew Jesus at that very intimate level that a mother knows her baby and her growing young child. And so her love wasn't just the love of a disciple, but the intimate, everlasting, you know, that heart walking around in the world that all parents know when your kids, you know, are born and they begin to toddle and then they leave you and you realize, like, your heart is no longer in your chest, it's out there walking around in the world, vulnerable. Only Mary had that kind of um, knowledge of Jesus and love of him. God makes surprising choices. God elects the poor. God elects the hungry to bear his image in very special ways. So that Jesus says that when we feed the poor, we are feeding him. So in Christ, God aligns himself in a very special way with those whom the world doesn't see as royal or as important. People like Mary. Now, I don't know if you've read the, it's called The Worst, and then it's crossed out, the best Christmas pageant ever. But Imogene Herdman, she's the oldest girl in the Herdman clan. She becomes Mary for the Christmas pageant, and she gets it. She catches this intimate side of God in her arms, and then in her heart. And it changes her, and it changes everyone around her. Now, Imogene was actually a pageant director's nightmare. Someone that's guaranteed to spell ruin for the annual Christmas pageant. She and her siblings were absolutely, the book says, were absolutely the worst kids in the history of the world. They lied, they stole, they smoked cigars, even the girls. <laughs> they talked dirty and hit little kids and cussed their teachers and took the name of the Lord in vain. And they set fire to French Schumacher's old broken down tool shed. <laughs> they were just so all around awful, you could hardly believe they were real. Ralph, Imogene, Leroy, Claude, Ollie, and Gladys. Six skinny, string-haired kids, all alike, except for being different sizes and having different black and blue places where they had all clunked each other. Now I'm guessing, I'm guessing that if we could get enough distance out to witness the condition of the whole human family, there would be a lot of black and blue places where we have clunked on each other. It might have been with mean words, with economic policies that reduce some to abject poverty while enriching others to obscene levels of wealth, with planning for war, carrying out war, domestic abuse, sexual harassment. We clock each other. To be sure, there are many, many examples, wonderful examples of kindness and compassion and bandaging up each other's wounds. There's also a whole lot of wounds to bandage up. So the herdmen have the human condition in spades. Poverty, neglect, abuse. They've done their worst with these kids. So all the 
kids around them, they kind of figured, well, let me just tell it to you in the narrator's voice. We figured they were headed straight for hell by way of the state penitentiary. Until, until they got themselves mixed up with the church and my mother and our Christmas pageant. Now, when the church, either by intentional choice or by happenstance, gets mixed up with people, whether people in jails or soup kitchens or addict recovery centers or just in regular ordinary lives, God is present. And adventures happen. And disasters happen. And redemption happens. Often in spite of ourselves. Now, Mother didn't expect to have anything to do with the Christmas pageant except to make me and my little brother, Charlie, be in it, which we didn't want to, and to make my father go and see it, which he didn't want to. But this mother, as many mothers do, rose to the occasion. And little did she know what was in store. Imogene, Imogene Herdman, who bit and blackmailed other kids, was the only one to raise her hand when it came time to volunteer to be married. It turns out that no one else volunteered because she had told the other girls that if they volunteered, she would stick pussy willow so far down their ears that nobody could reach it. And then it would sprout there. And it would grow and grow and they would spend the rest of their lives with a pussy willow bush growing out of their ears. Nobody else volunteered to be married. And then she offered her older brother Ralph to be Joseph. So the Herdmans take over all the major roles of the pageant. But they never, not ever, even once heard the Christmas story. For them, the whole story is all brand new. And they cannot believe it. They can't believe it. When Mother read about there being no room at the inn, Imogene's jaw dropped and she sat up in her seat. My God, she said, not even for Jesus? <laughs> well now, after all, Mother explained, nobody knew the baby was going to turn out to be Jesus. You said Mary knew, Ralph said. Why did she, why did he tell them? Or why didn't she tell them? Mary knew, why didn't she tell them? I would have told them, Imogene put in. Boy, would I have told them. What was the matter with Joseph that he didn't tell them? Her pregnant and everything, she grumbled. But when Imogene finds out about the feed trough and the swaddling clothes which wrap the baby up tight, <coughs> she pretty much loses it. You mean they tied him up and put him in a feed box, she said? Where was child welfare? <laughs> well, by the time the first rehearsal is over, our young narrator says that you would have thought the Christmas story came right out of the FBI files. <laughs> These kids got so involved in it. They wanted a bloody end to King Herod, worried about Mary having a baby in a dirty barn, and called the wise men a bunch of dirty spies. They left arguing about whether Joseph should have set fire to the inn or just chased the innkeeper into the <coughs> town. Come around to the pageant. There is tension because Mary and Joseph do not appear on cue. You know, the song builds up and Mary and Joseph are supposed to be there and they are not there. Well, Imogene and Ralph, as Mary and Joseph, for once did not come through the door pushing each other out of the way. They just stood there for a minute as if they weren't sure they were in the right place because of the candles, I guess, and the church being full of people. They looked like people you would see on the 6 o'clock news, refugees, sent away in some strange, ugly place with all their boxes and their sacks around them. And wasn't it like that for the Holy Family? stuck away in a barn by people who didn't much care what happened to them. They couldn't have been very neat and tidy either, but more like this Mary and Joseph. Imogene's veil was cockeyed as usual, and Ralph's hair stuck out all around his ears. Now Imogene has 
has the baby slung over her. No, no, she's a little cradle. This baby slung over her shoulder, and before she sets him in the manger, she thumps him twice on the back, just, you know, slaps him pretty good to burp him. Because she gets that Jesus was a real baby. A real baby. He might well have kept his mother up at night with colic. I mean, there were times that he was almost certainly fussy and, and hungry. Because that's the point of the whole thing. He was born and he lived as a real person. And so, as one would with a real baby, if you were in the Gene Herdman, you would back thwack him twice on the back to bourbon before laying him down. And when the Herdman Three Kings come in, they also get that in real life, a practical present might be far more welcome than oil and incense. They bring a ham, a very heavy ham. The same ham that had been given to them by the church charitable committee. Their own food basket ham with the Merry Christmas tag still attached. When the church is hushed, and everyone sings silent night, holy night, son of God, loves pure light. Imaging, this imaging with the crookedy veil, who has blackmailed her way into being Mary. She dissolves into tears. On the candlelight, her face is all shiny with tears, and she doesn't bother to wipe them away. She just sits there awful old imaging, crying and crying and crying. Why did God choose Mary? In fact, why did God choose those shepherds? Pretty much known as crooks and nasty old guys. Really, the Bible is full of those kind of whys. I mean, why the Jewish nation? and not one with greater armies or territories. Why the strange assortment, weird assortment of characters that become the prophets? Why the old and childless Abraham and Sarah? Why the mischievous, if not downright crooked, Jacob? Why adulterous King David? Why? I mean, that list goes right on down all the way until you get right through Mary, right through energy, until you get to us. <coughs> the truth is, even those of us in our white robes and beautiful garments, <laughs> leading the service, we are all pretty much a motley crew. We don't have our lives together as much as we might want. We come here with a mix of hopes and fears we come here with moments of faith and a whole lot of moments of faith. <coughs> We're probably a whole lot nicer than Imogene and the rest of the Herdmans. But we have no more right to expect God's favor than Imogene or Mary or King David or the shepherds. But God sees in a different kind of way than we do. God's calculation is completely different. He sees us. And he speaks to us. He calls us. He chooses us. He elevates us as his own beloved children to carry in our bodies the hope and glory of divinity. And the whole Christmas story, all of Jesus' life and death and resurrection that whole story that caused Imogene to dissolve into tears, it is all there to assure us of God's love and favor. <clears throat> Christmas is just a celebration of Jesus' birth. Not just of Jesus' birth, but that also in him we ourselves are be born as the children of God. Children, St. John tells us, who were born not of blood, or of the will, or of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. Blessed be God who calls you, chooses you, and 
blasted you with his love and 